we're going to talk today about <coughs> Ebola and measles just as a sort of centerpiece, but um, in covering in media science and health, you have two basic problems. One is people, and the other is news. Um, people. Science and math, in general, are not people's favorite subjects in high school or college. They try to get out of taking science and math courses. Those people then go on to be consumers of news, and they go on to be makers of news. So you have a basic anti-science and math bias in both consuming and producing it. When you are covering news, you look for shorthands. And one of the shorthands that they use is, a new study says. So people are primed when they read, a new study says, to believe that that's the truth. Um, if you proceed it by, a new study says, people will believe just about anything, because they don't have the science or math background to know if it's true. Um, as little as I like to believe that, I take yoga, and I was in my yoga class yesterday, and afterward, I, in a casual conversation with my yoga teacher, he said, oh, Anne, you work in television on science and medical sort of stuff. Um, I read this fabulous study. This study says this Japanese researcher took water and he labeled it uh, anger and hatred and love and peace. And he put it in the freezer and then he looked at microscopic and the love and peace ones are beautiful and the other ones look like battery acid. And it's proof, I mean, he studied this. And I just thought, okay, so I take this guy's advice on doing crow and tree pose and not on anything else. That's our audience. Guys who believe it because you can say a study says. Then there's news. What is news is what is scary or negative a lot of the time because millions of kids went for their annual checkup and they're just fine is not a news story. Uh, even a new study that says childhood leukemia rate is much higher now than it was 20 years ago isn't really a news story. However, oh my God, autism, it's much, much higher now than it ever was. That feels more like a news study because it's a little scary. It's a little threatening. People feel more interested because we are human beings in what threatens us because they think they'll find a way to solve it or protect themselves. Whereas hearing good news is like, yeah, well, I sort of expect good news. I get that in my life. Um, so people go for the shorthand and that goes for people who make the news as well. So people I deal with every day, um, I just by happenstance, my parents were both doctors and I was pre-med in college before I decided not to go to medical school. So I end up working nat right now on um, a unit at ABC News that covers health and medical. So I actually have two cents worth of knowledge in the health field. And I work with Dr. Rich Besser uh, and Dr. Jen Ashton who have many more than two cents worth of knowledge in the health field. So I'm sort of the TV, what we'll get on TV part, and they're the let's make sure it's true part. Um, when Ebola and measles came up, now clearly one of these diseases is not going to kill Americans. Um, and people were terrified of it, Ebola, terrified of it. And it was very clear right from the beginning, we kept saying, okay, but the chances of people getting Ebola in America. Then there's another story, which may very well kill a lot of Americans, which is measles. People not so scared of measles, because they've heard of measles. Didn't, didn't your sister have measles when she was little? Yeah, people have measles, and they don't really get it that that's actually much, much, much more of a threat to them than Ebola is. Um, so our job, and this panel's job, because all of us work in health, is to try and get that truth out. And we did it well or not well, and we'll talk about that. So who the heck is sitting next to me, you say to yourself? Laura Helmuth. She is a science and health editor for Slate Magazine. I'm reading this because I don't want to screw it up. Uh, recently published skeptical stories about homeopathy, one of my favorites, uh, the food babe, Chinese medicine, and other anti-science nonsense, as she phrases it. Uh, she oversaw Slate's Ebola coverage and coverage of the anti-vaccine mo uh, movement. 
to my left is Dr. Paul Offit, who you probably recognize um, because he's on the backs of books that he has written. Uh, he is a professor of pediatrics at the Perelman, Perelman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. He is the co-inventor of a rotavirus vaccine licensed for use in all children in 2006, so he has saved a whole hell of a lot of lives. And he is the author, thank you, yes. And he is the author of many books for lay readers about science and medicine. And Dr. Mark Krislip, who is the medical director of infectious diseases and the chairman of infection control for Legacy Health, a six hospital system in Portland, Oregon. And he is part of the preparation and response to infections, both as a clinician and for that hospital system. So I will throw it out to the panel and say, how do you think we did on Ebola and measles? If you don't mind, I'll start. I, I, measles was interesting. So, so last year, um, there were 650 cases of measles in the United States. That was the biggest outbreak we've had in more than 20 years. Nobody cared. I mean, it was it, it centered for the most part on an Amish community in Medina County, Ohio. At least 385 of the cases were there. People saw that as an insular community, not us. Didn't get picked up either by the media or, frankly, by parents. We, ABC News did a story on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, the, the, this year, there was an outbreak in Disney that centered on Disney that now has involved 17 states. It's been about 180 people. Um, it, it, we're on pace, for the most part, to be somewhere near last year's epidemic, and everybody cared. I mean, the, the, I've never seen, frankly, a level of anger from parents against those parents who had chosen not to vaccinate their children and thus put those children and, and others with whom they came in contact at risk. There, it's the media covered this story. Parents in Southern California were getting measles vaccines at rates they'd never gotten them before, and and now I think seven states are considering overturning their philosophical exemptions to vaccination. What, what, what's amazing to me about this is that it's still, you, and you said it earlier on, the the the. The, you're right. I mean, I think the, the line that uh, you're, you're at greater risk of being married to Kim Kardashian than dying of Ebola in this country is, is true. But um, the, the, um, still, you know, still it's been 180 cases of measles in a population of more than 310 million people. Pre-vaccine, there were, you know, 3 million cases, 48,000 uh, hospitalizations and 500 deaths. So you're far more likely to die of human papillomavirus in this country. And yet our immunization rates for human papillomavirus are woeful, right? 38% for girls to complete the series, 13% for boys. There are 25,000 cases of cancer and 4,000 deaths every year from, from, from strains of HPV that could be prevented by vaccination. And we're more scared of measles right now than we are of HPV. So I would argue that we still don't get where the real risks lie. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, it's hard to say because, you know, how did the media do? Um, the media is a wide spectrum of interaction, so, you know, the Internet is a lot worse than a major news corporation. I'm My local newspaper <laughs> is always clueless, so I know the Oregonian's going to get it wrong with great um, regularity. The interesting thing I always think when it comes to watching people react to this is the inability of people to cope with, with the risk of getting a disease. The, the story I like to use to show that is I had a patient who was a heroin user who got a heart valve infection. He lived on the street. He drank a six pack a day, uh, I'm sorry, 12 pack a day and smoked two packs of cigarettes a day. And he came in with a little shortness of breath. And I said, well, we need to get a chest x-ray to make sure your heart valve isn't failing. And he said, no. And I said, why? He said, well, I don't want the radiation exposure. <laughs> and that's a true story. And the complete inability of people to recognize the risk of disease is really what's fascinating about the response in general to outbreaks. Because the disease that keeps me scared year after year, nobody cares about it, is not, is not measles or Ebola, but influenza. Flu. I wait for the big die off from influenza that someday may happen. I don't worry. And Ebola to me was like going to be a pain in the neck. Because if one shows up in my hospital, the hospital is basically going to shut down because of the work. So did the media do a good job? It sometimes depends on where you look. Anytime I saw Donald Trump's face, I thought, eh, wrong response to Ebola. So it's very variable, I think. <laughs> Well, as an editor for an internet-based magazine, I, I have to take issue with the idea that there's a, I mean, there, it's true. The signal-to-noise ratio on the internet is, um, is poor and getting worse mm -hmm. all the time, but there is some signal there. Uh, and so what th those of us who try to be responsible in our media coverage mm -hmm. try to do is increase the signal, uh, fight all the noise. It's, it's an endless battle. We'll never win it, but we've got to keep fighting. 
Um, and of course, past year, measles and Ebola show some of the things that the media have done, you know, completely right and completely wrong. Um, the wrong, of course, with Ebola was the panic. It was shameful. Looking back, and I, I just, the other day I just went through all of the Ebola coverage, and a lot of what we do on Slate is debunk um, myths, fight bad information, call out other media when they're doing stupid things, and boy, there was a lot of stupid things. Um, and a, a lot of it, you know, played on people's fear, and that's, you know, we're focusing on that today. And the thing with fear is fear sells. And uh, in the media, um, even though we try to have very, you know, elevated notions of what it is we do here, we're also in the entertainment industry, and we're competing for attention. And we, when you can scare people, they will come and keep reading you. And I think a lot of media people got trapped in that this year, mm -hmm. with, with Ebola especially. It was really shameful. Fear is um, more contagious than any virus, yeah. which was a line we actually got to put into a piece because one of the things we try really, really hard, ABC News is extremely conscious that our integrity is our brand. And so we really make a big point of having everything in the medical sphere that, that I can touch, that Rich can touch, that is true. And there is sometimes, because ABC News is filled with people. Um, not, I wouldn't say pressure, but definitely confusion about what is true. Mm -hmm. Because when um, the guy was coming from Liberia to Texas, they said, and he got on a plane. So we're gonna do on the plane. We wanna have a piece about the risk on the plane. And I said, okay, here's the risk on the plane. Yeah. Um, and they didn't believe me. They were like, no, we, you know, because these are people, everybody has seen contagion. Everyone's seen Gwyneth Paltrow with blood coming out of her nose, and she was on a plane, and <laughs> Ebola makes blood come out of your nose, and all the people on the plane. And I, we, at the beginning of Ebola, were sort of obeying the TV rules. Good Morning America is on while people have breakfast. World News is on while people have dinner. So you say you can't get Ebola unless you have close personal contact with the bodily fluids of a patient. <laughs> um, I finally was explaining it to people on individual shows, like, and they said, but, but if you're sitting next to somebody with a communicable disease, I was like, okay, if you're sitting next to him when he's very sick, so sick that you would notice this guy is really sick, and you turn to him at the same time that he turns to you, and he throws up directly into your open mouth. <laughs> That'll do it. Yeah. There, you might get Ebola. Uh, and so we had to start using words like of things that you don't say on TV, believe me, vomit, diarrhea, blood. We, I had to put those words into scripts, and people were like, are you sure we got? <laughs> it's like, guys, we're at the point where we need to say this. We need to say, unless someone with Ebola vomits on you, unless you clean up someone who is covered with diarrhea and blood, who has active, visible, very, very sick Ebola, you're fine. That's why the only people who are getting it are the nurses, because that's what they do. When it was on the cruise ship, oh my God, I can't tell you, you know, cruise of terror is what <laughs> everybody wants to say, because that's where you go. It's like. The problem with this, and it would be easy for us to say within ABC News, to, no, just squash that story. Don't do it. It's stupid. There's no way anybody on this cruise ship is going to get Ebola. Because the woman who was exposed was exposed to triple bagged blood samples, which she did not, as far as I know, drink. Uh, and she was in her cabin where she was being kept by, I assume, people with pitchforks and torches. <laughs> and they were coming back. So why then a Coast Guard helicopter lowers a basket, they didn't even cut, touch anyone on board, very important, and they got a blood sample from the woman in the basket and they were flying it back. Well, even if she had Ebola, if she was not symptomatic, it wouldn't show up in that blood test. So the whole thing was just a kabuki dance. Yeah. And I said, let's not even cover it. And Rich Besser, because he is smarter than I am, said, no, I think we have to cover it because you can't minimize people's fears. Fears are genuine. He went and did a town hall in Dallas where all of this was unfolding because he said people in Dallas are terrified and they're, they don't know about this and they're right to be terrified because people love their families. If I live in Dallas and I think, erroneously, that one of my kids is 
possibly going to die of this terrifying exotic disease. I'm right to be scared until I'm informed that I don't need to be. So you can't just say, I'm not going to report on it. You have to recognize that people have a right to be frightened and then try to talk to them in a way that they can grasp the truth. But it's anybody's guess to, to know how well or badly. You, nine of us at nine different media outlets, all of the efforts of the people here could be great, and then you get two terrifying stories on, on you know, networks not to be named, or um, <laughs> the internet, and everyone's like, but, but I read it. it, it was right here, I heard him say it, I got the transcript, and, I, and then you're off to the races again. Yeah, you know, I, I think the CDC did not help you with yeah. regard to Ebola. It's the, the um, you're right, it's, it's not measles, it's not influenza, which is to say it's not spread by small droplets spread from the respiratory route. But when you're, as the, they say in the medical world, wet, meaning when you have vomiting and diarrhea, you're quite contagious. I mean, there's a ton of virus in, in vomitus. Much and more than HIV. So, so you are contagious, but, but when there was that healthcare worker who, uh, who was eventually found to be, you know, positive, have been exposed to Ebola, who was on the, the plane, the CDC interviewed all the people who were on that plane. That sent exactly the wrong message. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could have sat next to her on that plane, you could have kissed her on that plane, and you weren't going to get Ebola. But, right. but when they interviewed everybody, they didn't help. Also, they could have, I think, had people on the ground in Dallas at that suburban hospital much quicker and, trans frankly, transmitted that, that person back to, uh, yeah. to a Tamari because, you know, there they were much more fast all about taking care of that disease, whereas I think they can't expect the nurses at that suburban hospital to really understand that disease. So I think, I think the CDC didn't help you a lot mm -hmm. here. Yeah, they did a lot of security theater, um, also with the negative air pressure and the hazmat suits and, you know, like three levels. And the screening at the airport. Yeah, I mean, it, it really, it's, it's like when you go through TSA and you have to take off your shoe. I mean, that's theater. Nobody's going to have a shoe bomb again. And, you know, there's all these things that we're fighting the last war and just acting like we're doing something because you have to do something. Um, but sometimes doing something is completely counterproductive and spreads misinformation and makes people more panicked. And when they panic, they tend to not do smart things. So, yeah, I think, I think obviously the media, I hope, learned a lot of things, but I think CDC hopefully did too for the next time. But on the fear idea, I think it is completely legitimate for the CDC to talk to everybody on those planes because everybody on those planes is scared. Yeah. And they're allowed to, and whether or not it's theater, if the public thinks, what would the alternative be? And the CDC isn't even contacting the people who are on the plane. They could be anywhere. They could be dropping their children off in my children's daycare. They could be sitting next to me in a room. You know, that's the last thing you want. But you don't want. you think they sent a message that these people were at risk? I thought that's the way it got interpreted. Well, e the problem is, even when you say out loud, although these people have zero risk of contracting Ebola, the CDC is talking to everybody on the airplane. Well, everyone hears, oh, well, if they're talking to them on the airplane, there must be a reason they're talking, even though they, you know. People, I think it might be part of our lizard brain that we want to defend ourselves from risks. So we are very willing to be scared. Now, people in public health, though, are screwed no matter what they do. Yeah. It can, you know, I got 30 years of outbreaks behind me, influenza, and it just, you know, every year there's a new bug. And if the CDC isn't aggressive enough, they get screwed. And if they're not aggressive, and they're too aggressive, they get screwed. You cannot in any way whatsoever in public health give the right answer. Because whatever you do is going to be over... It's either too much or too little, and they never hit the sweet spot. And I don't think it's possible for them to hit the sweet spot, because whatever they do is going to be wrong, in part because nobody trusts them, but because the diseases have a lot of caveats and explanations and what-ifs to it, and they have to give simple, clear, declarative sentences as part of their job. And medicine cannot be described in simple, clear, declarative sentences, except perhaps, he's dead, Jim. And <laughs> Every other thing is a matter of caveat. Who's the patient? What's the circumstances? What's going on? It becomes complicated and subtleties. And communication is not done that way. And so you're always going to be screwed in your final analysis. And, and you can't say there is no, what we, what we were saying off camera was, there is no risk that any of those people on the plane have got Ebola. Well, I don't know if there was a spontaneous mutation in the middle of the Atlantic. I guess there's, so doctors will never go on the record saying there is no risk. 
But but again, I I, I guess I'm gonna I, I I think that it was never clear to me from watching the way that the CDC was explaining this that, that that they made it very clear that this is not spread by the respiratory route. It's not measles. It's not flu. That that, I, that never became clear to me. And of, you're right. Of course, I mean science teaches us that we can either reject or not reject the null hypothesis. We can never accept it. So we have a lot of trouble saying words like never. Yeah. But, the, but right. the fact of the matter is what you, how you communicate to another scientist, frankly, is different than how you communicate to the public. And with, when you communicate to the public, you have to be willing to say things more definitively. I mean, you, you know, I say, for example, vaccines don't cause autism. Technically, the data never allow me to say that. I can right. only say that they haven't been associated with autism at a certain level of statistical power. But, but I think with, that's not how the, the public hears and it. And with science-averse people, they, as soon as you start saying, uh, it, they glaze over. They want to hear their neighbor explain it to them. One of the things that when we interview doctors, they, they are used to speaking on panels and to other doctors, and they want to say the second quartile of the experimental group was not found, you know, P was larger than one, and it was not statistically significant, and you're just totally lost by this point. You don't even know what the hell they're talking about. So we keep, in interview situations, I keep saying, okay, that's very interesting, doctor. Can you talk to me like I'm your neighbor's kind of stupid 16-year-old child? <laughs> Because that that's I'll not hear. a bad exaggeration. I mean, to give a story, I had a patient with meningitis. I told the family, your daughter has an infection in the fluid that surrounds her brain. And the father said, Doc, we're simple folk. Could you explain that in a way I can understand it? Uh -huh. I said, ugh. I drew him a picture, and that actually helped. But you can't, it's, a, your, your 16 year old, slightly stupid neighbor is actually probably has better comprehension. <laughs> and I mean, I don't know how my car works, you know? Yeah. And I have no need to know how my car works. And when I go in to get my car fixed, my guy tells me, do you need to get it fixed? I go, okay. Um, and most people are that way with healthcare. They don't know yeah. and don't yeah. need to know, really. So it's difficult to communicate. And the thing that's our, the, uh, the, what I am always getting feedback on on our stories is that the problem with a lot of big stories, cancer, heart disease, stroke, is that what, is, um, what they always want to know is, well, what can people do? Nobody wants to hear it. Eat right, sleep a lot, exercise. Are you thrilled yet? <laughs> Will you come back after the commercial? And coming up, ways to beat stroke. Eat right, sleep, <laughs> and exercise. I don't want to eat right. <laughs> or exercise, and I get as much sleep as I can, damn it. So the bottom line for all sorts of conditions that people are very interested in is eat, right, sleep, and get exercise. So we have to find different ways to not say that out loud, but to imply it strongly. And because uh, particularly with world news, they have a very, very narrow window of your attention and they want to keep it. When I worked at Good Morning America, I always said, the first 10 seconds of your story have to be really incredibly grabbing. Because picture your entire audience is naked, with a shower cap on, with one foot raised, and they're like, should I take a shower now or should I watch this? I'll take a shower. <laughs> so if your first 15 seconds isn't really startling or interesting. One of the things that I think you were talking about is how you get people, how you get people interested in regular stories, which seem like boring stories. There's no way to say, the, the reason that listicles do so well is 17 things you can do tomorrow to make sure your leg doesn't fall off. And you think, <laughs> well, what are they? And they're yes. eat right, exercise. <laughs> That's only three. That's right. That's only three things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and so that's, and especially with the competition from all the, you know, woo out there, all the misinformation, all the nonsense, all the anti-science, the trick is to tell stories that are more compelling, um, not just because they're true, but because they're well told, because the people are interesting, because you can bring some insight to the world. And so um, you're seeing an evolution, even just in the past year, in especially print media, what they're willing to say, which is that this is right and that is wrong. Um, and unfortunately, you know, we're talking about what scientists can say and can't say, and all the caveats, and uh, with this degree of statistical significance, which is all very important. Um, but in media, there was all a similar... All very annoying. It's, yeah, <laughs> it is. 
<laughs> but we've had the same problem, which is uh, that journalists are taught to, to give balance to any story. And if, if it's a political story and you interview somebody from this side, you need equal number of people from the other and, and balance it. And it's ridiculous when it comes to things like vaccines and, uh, and climate change and evolution. And finally, just in the past few years, um, you're getting uh, not just the specialist uh, science, science writers who've been doing this for a while, but even just basic reporters are now very clear about saying that vaccines don't cause autism. Um, but the problem is that's boring. That's like saying eat, you know, eat your vegetables and exercise and sleep right. And so the trick is to to find you know more interesting ways to say that and to use, um, you know, unfortunately the the forces of woo, which include using anecdotes. Oh, uh, so and the famous phrase I don't know if you guys know it, but these guys certainly do it was the plural of anecdote is not data. Yeah, and that's been really important, especially with measles, which, you know, as you said, it's something, oh, yeah, measles, whatever, so-and-so's cousin had that, and they didn't die. Um, so we've, we had, on Slate, we had a story uh, called Growing Up Unvaccinated, and it was some woman who was raised in kind of a, you know, new age cult type of thing, and she caught everything. She was miserable, had a terribly sick childhood, and it, uh, you know, it's an anecdote, it's one person, but it does sort of make it real why you need to get vaccines, and it's not just some theoretical danger, but it's actually misery that you're avoiding in your children. Mm -hmm. yeah, you, you know, I think... You said it earlier, it's, it's fear that compels. I mean, I think you're just far more compelled by fear than reason. So for all the education that many of us have been doing for the last 15 years about how it's important, you know, to get your measles vaccine, because there's probably no better indicator of the strength of a national immunization program than measles. It's a highly effective vaccine. We essentially eliminated measles from this country in the year 2000, but it is a highly contagious virus. So the minute you have any fraying of herd immunity, it starts to come back, and it's come back. And so now people are scared of measles, and now they want to get the vaccine, but it had to come to that. It had to come to, at least so far this year, 180 children suffering, about half of whom got hospitalized with a disease that certainly makes you sick. I mean, you know, we talk a lot about how vaccines have become a victim of their own success, and I think that's true, but what's starting to happen now is I think the anti-vaccine movement is starting to become a victim of its own success mm -hmm. because they've scared people enough not to get vaccines, and you're starting to see these diseases come back. Well, the problem also that we are encountering is that, encountering, it's very hard to get someone to go on camera to say, I'm not vaccinating my kids. The closest we've gotten was to get a delayer. And, you know, they, they uh, God help me, they had reason on their side. They have twin girls who were two. And they say, look, we play with them in our living room and at the park. When we're at the park, it's a day, we, we go only there when there are no other kids there. When we get them into preschool, we're going to vaccinate them because that's when they're going to start really encountering other kids. But frankly, we're overwhelmed by having twins, so we, we can't take them out a whole lot. So we don't see why we need to do this. Hopefully there, were, there was nobody else there for the previous two hours. <laughs> yeah. It's true. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, measles, measles, you know, the this, this small droplets and hang in the air for two hours. But they said, you know, really, what's the risk of that? Really in hard numbers, really? And, you know, I, I can't say I am going to stand here and tell you your two, two cute little daughters are going to have measles in the next six months. You know, you, and, and non-vaccinators are not going to be swayed from what I've seen and read by any of this information. They, because they think they're being good parents. They're not doing it to be mean. They're doing it because they love little Binky and the thought of people injecting viruses and like scary diseases into little Binky one after the other. 39 diseases into little Binky and just me so small. I mean, they're, it's not that they're trying to be mean to their kid. They're, they're in their way. They think they're protecting their child. So you can't yell at them. No, it's just, it's just, and so they, they're probably right. I mean, the odds are you're not going to get most of these diseases. A few of them have been eliminated, and the other ones are rare. Um, but the, some of them aren't so rare. I mean, influenza is not rare. Um, pneumococcus is still out there. Chickenpox is still out there. But the odds are, statistically, they're not going to be infected until they are infected. And, and that's if you ever talk to these parent advocacy groups, the parents all tell the same story. I can't believe this happened to me. And then they become vigorous activists to educate about the disease and educate about the importance of the, the vaccine. I mean, at the end of this month, there's the National Meningitis Association Gala here in New York City. Talk to those parents. I, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's painful. It's just heartbreaking. Why take a chance? I think people, people think that a choice not to get a vaccine is a risk-free choice. It's not. It's just a choice to take a different and more serious risk. And although I think it's a, it's, it is a game of Russian roulette, it's not sort of five empty chambers and one bullet, it's 100,000 empty chambers and a bullet, but why put the gun to your head when you can, when you can prevent these diseases safely? And Mark, you think more outbreaks are coming our way? Of one sort or another. 
but that's just optimism on my part. <laughs> Since I make a living from infectious diseases. But, I mean, if it isn't vaccine preventable, there, we're probably going to, I would bet in the next year or two, going to see a nice huge outbreak of chikungunya virus in the southern half of the United States. Mm -hmm. um, any, you know, I never worried about Ebola because um, it's hard to spread. More people die, you know, of car accidents in the United States so far than I think have died of Ebola, unless the numbers have gotten more. But half of everyone, I've heard this statistic, I don't know if it's true or not, but half of every human being that's ever died has died of a mosquito-borne illness. And so whenever we have a mosquito-borne illness coming our way, um, like chikungunya, uh, that gives me pause, and that is the thing to worry about. There is a vaccine in production, hopefully, um, so I'm not going to get it. Um, but uh, not, I'm not going to get chicken gun yet. I will get the vaccine. But I hope to see more outbreaks of one thing or another as time goes by. They're no, you, pretty you, much you, inevitable. You point out to the, what is the most dangerous aspect of getting a vaccine, which is driving to the office to get it. Mm. <laughs> Especially in New York City, I can tell you that the drivers here. <laughs> well, uh, look, Jeez. I remember, I've had to try to explain. I've now actually, I believe, got explained to most of the people who run shows at ABC News some basic facts about studies. Because people who don't look at studies don't know about them. And the example I use is uh, more people are killed by car accidents within five miles of their home than anywhere else. And I remember hearing this when I was young, and when I learned to drive in Los Angeles, I was like, as the counter clicked to five miles, I was like, <laughs> going to be real careful here because I know more of these accidents. It never occurred to me that that's because most driving is done within five miles of your home. Oh. Um, so people in my office will come to me and they'll say, I've really, I've got this study that I read somewhere, and it says that... I've gotten them to figure out that so just because something is correlated doesn't mean that it's causative. It is not that it is magically causes car accidents because it's within five miles of your home. It's correlated with the distance from your home because of another factor. Um, there is so much bad science out there that it's a blizzard fighting it off every day. One of my faves within the last three weeks, and I thought, because I knew I was coming here, I thought, oh, I'll remember that when it's good. Uh, we got a little note from uh, the dot-com arm of ABC News saying, I read this. Is there anything to it? If so, I want to write it up. And I clicked on it, and it was The Guardian, a newspaper in England. Um, and it said, new study shows that 34 is the happiest year. Oh. And you think, well, that's interesting. And now you think in terms of viewership, everybody who's 34 is going to be going like this. And everybody who's 32 is going to be saying, wow, that's going to be great. And everyone who's 43 is going to be like, did I miss it? And, <laughs> you know, it's, it's very clickable. So I thought, okay, I read the article, and it referred to the study, and I went back to that, and it referred to the study. It was another article that went back that referred to a press release that then I went back, and, you know, it, it, this was really annoying, and I was having, I was, meanwhile, we work with medical residents at ABC News who are there to vet stuff for us, so I was having the residents see if they could find the study. They were coming up empty. It was referred to a, a Yale study on the happiest year, and I'm, I went to Yale, and I'm thinking, well, ooh. Maybe I should just call Yale directly, the press office. And I finally got to something a little more substantive, and it said that um, Dr. I can't remember the guy's name, Dr. John Smith, uh, the medical specialist at Yale Security, said that the most uh, comfortable year was uh, 34. And I was like, Yale Security? The lock people. <laughs> They had done a survey, which is not a study. Survey is, I ask you questions, which means that it's completely non-scientific because they can choose to ask just the front row questions, and we all know that only crazy people sit in the front row. Um, <laughs> but the, yeah, it, among the many questions which determined their happiness in different decades and at different ages was, did they have a home security system? Because that makes people feel safe and happy. It was a survey done by a lock company, and we were about to report it as a Yale study about happiness. <laughs> That's the every day, every day, we have to fight against this because we actually do want to tell the truth. 
I mean, are you uh, beset by the same oh, monsters? Yeah. Yeah. And then four people during the day will come through and say, oh, I got this study here that says that 32 is the most happy. So do you have any doctors we can interview on this about why psychologically? And I'm like, well, I have a lock on my door. Yeah. And you can ask that. And then they'd all say, oh, are you serious? Oh, well, never mind. You know, I mean, these are people like on Good Morning America who are trying to fill two hours a day with interesting stuff that'll make you watch. Yeah, that's one of the most important things we do is stop stupid things from getting more attention than they're already getting. And that's something that you all can do. I mean, um, I'm sure, does anybody have a friend on Facebook who posts things from natural news? <laughs> anybody? <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> we all do. It's, you know, people, often blood relatives, you have no, you know. <laughs> oh, you have your to cousin. talk to Thanksgiving. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You can't just say you're an idiot. But, but um, you know, what, what we do professionally is, is stop people from spreading stupid things online, uh, online or on the air. And uh, that's something you can help do, which is, you know, ev consider every link to Snopes, every debunking story, every skeptical. Uh, no, actually, the data are from Yale locks, not from Yale University. If you find yourself also chasing things down a rabbit hole and realize that somebody's got something completely wrong online, especially if you can get to it early before it goes viral, um, you know, we're all in this together trying to stop stupid, wrong nonsense from spreading in the world. So anytime you do that, you're, it's a little moment of heroism in your day. <laughs> I don't know. Given Yale's integrative medicine program, I, <laughs> yeah, right. I think I'd go with Yale locks. <laughs> um, do you think we should take questions? Yeah, sure. do you think, sure. Does anybody have any questions for any of us? In the hotel business. Oh, Hello. Marry me. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, before we get to, before <laughs> we get to that, <laughs> in the hotel business, the organization chart has the guest at the top of the chart. The head of the company is at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you: What are you going to do next time? My sense, listening to all of you, you're all a little bit wringing your hands, frustrated with those people out there. And I've, I mean, I'm as frustrated as the next guy. <laughs> but ask, asking a question, what are you going to do? What are we, if I can include myself in the media, what are we going to do next time to try to help people understand the risks of this or that with respect to diseases? And uh, I think I have another follow-up. Has to anybody studied people? how many people a study how many people know somebody who's been uh, killed by a traditional virus or has gotten polio, died of the flu and stuff? Because I think it's surprisingly high. But uh, lead on. You start? No, I'll, I'll, I'll do part two. You do part two now. Um, speak for your first question, which is how the media can handle this, but I think in terms of how we on the sort of clinicians can handle it is, is to um, try and, and, and um, fight misinformation by, one, providing the information that, that hopefully or lessens that concern, and, and do it in a very passionate and provocative and compelling way, um, and compassionate way. I mean, so, so in, in answer to your question, do I see children die of vaccine-preventable diseases? I see it every year. I mean, there, there's not a year that goes by at Children's Hos of Hospital of Philadelphia where we don't see a child die of influenza, pneumococcus, I mean, um, the, the, the occasionally flu, so, I'm sorry, flu, pneumococcus, and pertussis. Those three are, the, are sort of our killers. Um, you know, we just had a, kid, a child who just six months ago, okay, you know, the, the parents saw us, saw us as an outpatient at two months, four months, and six months of age, claimed they didn't want to get any vaccines because they had recently converted to Muslim, even though they had vaccinated their other children. The child got pneumococcal meningitis at one year of age, and it's so severely that the brain herniated down onto the brain stem, caused the child to stop breathing. We saved his life, but he, he will be vegetative for the years that he lives, which will probably just be another five or six years. We participated in that in some level. I mean, by, by sort of accepting, in this case, a religious exemption, but whatever the reason is, we, we accepted that out of sort of respect for the parent and stood back. And I just think we, we have to have that image in our mind whenever we talk to children, the image of this child who could have been a 70 or 80 year life that would have been happy and fulfilling, but instead was snuffed out by the ignorance of that parent. And at some level, by our inability to sort of step forward and really passionately try and not let that happen. I think, you know, these days doctors are trained to be 
um, to make sure the parent and the patient is very much, you know, part of the decision-making process, which means at some level you're seeding your expertise. I mean, you're letting, the, you know, you want to make that decision in concert, which means at some level you have to be willing to watch someone make a bad decision that can hurt their child. And I think um, we just have to be willing to be more prescriptive. Uh, just, last story, and I'll stop. The, the, I mean, recently I had surgery on my right eye for a, a corneal defect that was congenital, and I went to the, the, the doctor, this, you know, Shea Eye Hospital at the University of Pennsylvania, and uh, he said, well, here's your medical options and here's your surgical options. What would you like? What are you, a waiter? Yeah, I mean, you know, tell me, what, what do you think I should do? I mean, you're the doctor, I, you know, and so tell me what to do. And, and I, I sort of, I think, gets lost. I mean, pe people think they can go as much as anybody who's giving them advice. And I think it's a part of, it's part of the problem. It's a level of hubris that's a problem. In so what I'm driving at is imagine the viewer in charge mm -hmm. and you're in middle manager. That's all. Yeah, um, all we can do is try to, people don't like broccoli, they like dessert. I can try to make our stories as much appearing as dessert as I can while stuffing broccoli in the corner. Um, you have to speak to people in a way they can hear. You can't say uh, close personal contact with bodily fluids. You have to say vomit, diarrhea, blood. Um, and it's an education process with the folks I work for. I've now got them to understand what studies are like, what, and we also did for a long time, we did here's Sally stories, which I object to, which is here's Sally. Sally suffers from fill in the blank, but there's new hope for Sally because there's blinkity blinkity blink. Now back to Sally. Oh, I'll take this new drug procedure, whatever, and I'll be better because what everybody thought the way to get to people with information was, well, you have to give it a character. So find a Sally for every single bloody health piece. There was, meet Sally, and I'm like, oh, I'd rather not. Um, <laughs> so we have to be better at telling the story in a compelling way and getting sleep, eat, exercise in there in a way that they can hear. And so that's on us. Yeah, when it, when it comes to measles and the anti-vaccine movement and whooping cough, I mean, I think we have actually this year seen some progress. I mean, all of us have known for a long time that there's this conspiracy to claim that there's a conspiracy, which <laughs> we're not the conspiracy. The conspiracy actually is perpetuating all these lies and misinformation and, and the, you know, the completely discredited fraudulent link between vaccines We, we and just autism. haven't invited you to the meetings. <laughs> but that's right. Is the, the meeting sponsored by the, all the money that's being made in, in vaccines. Yes. Uh, but we, are, we are accused of being, you know, and, and there, if you watch news shows, there's a whole lot of commercials for Cialis and Viagra and aspirin, and the pharma does advertise on television. So they all say, oh, you're in the pocket, and they told you not to tell this story. And I can tell you, I mean, nobody tells us to do squat because... That's the way you lose your credibility, and we have been underlined because of recent events in television news that we will not exaggerate, and we will not lie, and we will, I mean, they had meetings after that and said, so we're all clear here, right? You're telling the truth about everything. And we were like, yeah, join the parade. I mean, we've been trying to get you to do that, and not to say, cruise ship of death, and you know. <laughs> yeah, it was useful. I mean, the shame, you know. Our, our colleagues who behaved badly, we can shame them, and, yep. and we will. That helps. Uh, yeah. Uh, shame, embarrassment, and I also, I mean, it, you know, it's not truly a rational way to communicate, but uh, emotion works, and if, if more and more parents are pissed off that other parents are exposing their own children and the whole world and, and infants who can't be vaccinated yet, I mean, there's, um, I think there, there has been a lot of, uh, of awareness, uh, much more this year because of Disney. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's kind of sad that it takes a, a link to Disney to get people to pay attention or to get, I should say, not, not, not make the, the hotel guest the, uh, the cause of all this, but, you know, we're the ones who, who send other stories. But, you know, we, we use Disney as much as possible to say, hey, pay attention. This could really happen to you. And I hate to, I don't want to wish ill on any child, but as powerful as anecdote is in anti-science, it's probably just as powerful in yeah. science. So God help us, we have to have a cheerful, adorable, much videotaped, cute little kid die of measles. And when we have that, 
that per, that poor little child will become the poster child of, and Susie and Bob didn't think it could happen there to their little Melanie. And Susie and Bob were like, we were told by the anti-vaccine movement that we were protecting our child, and now, and that story will get retold and retold, and because it's an anecdote, people will flock to it, and that'll help. And, 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 it, and it proves that we failed. Uh, if it, if, when it comes to that, when it comes to children suffering or being hospitalized or dying, then we fail to, to get our message across. I mean, it's always the children who suffer our ignorance. It's just yeah. hard. Okay, so I'm going off to Bill Nye, so that's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> I wanted to know, so we're all skeptics. We are, I'm sure some of us have blogs, tiny little blogs, have maybe have podcasts. So we as a collective voice are out there. We do have the ability to rein in people, to talk to our crazy aunts. What I want to know is how as people, as small time um, citizen journalists, how we can make a difference as a group. Oh, that's great. I'm so glad you're doing it. And thank you to everybody who runs a skeptical blog. Um, it's, it's a huge service. You know, a lot of times you'll, you'll be writing and not a whole lot of people will see it. Um, but sometimes you never know what's going to go viral. And, uh, you know, you shouldn't write with the expectation that something will because you can never count on it. And it's entirely not up to you. They're just random forces of chaos at work. Um, but you're definitely adding to the knowledge and truth in the world and the signal to the noise ratio. And um, especially, so I, I edit a lot of stories about health and science, and I also republish a lot of things from blogs on Slate, and that just you know, kind of amplifies the message. So if you're writing something and there's a story you think deserves a much wider audience, um, please get in touch any time and, you know, and, and ask if it's something we might be able to republish. I think it's important that you're just doing it, because most people don't care. I mean, the term that was uh, thought up a while ago was shruggies. Most people, eh, they got other things to do. The fact that you're doing it does make a difference. I've actually been amazed when I hear that actually people listen to my podcast. It always kind of surprises me, and it's kind of nice. And if you, just the fact of doing it and putting it out there is a little bit against the tide, and the summation of all those little actions in the end have benefit. So just doing it is great. Anybody else have anything to um, I have a, a, a niece who's recently had, who had like a four-year-old, five-year-old child, okay? And she doesn't want to have it vaccinated, okay? Now, I've kind of explained to her, you know, all the stuff about, you know, the background. But her comeback is always, well, it's like big pharma, it's kind of, you know, involved. They, they just want to make money, and they don't care about, you know, your child and stuff. So how, how, how can I answer that, you know, how can you respond to, you know, something like that? You know, like, do you have a big pharma conspiracy who's greedy, da-da-da? Yeah, but there's, you know, big grocery stores. They just want to sell you groceries. <laughs> and big mattress. They just want you to sleep. You know, yeah, they're going to sell you stuff. So, so here's what I would say. First of all, there were, there were 27 companies that made vaccines in 1955. By 1980, there were 18 companies that made vaccines. Today, essentially, there are four companies that make vaccines. They're not big money makers for these companies. They're, and there aren't individual vaccine makers anymore. Now they're all part of a sort of bigger pharmaceutical companies. I mean, vaccines are something you take once or a few times in your lifetime. They don't touch these, these drugs that you're taking every day, you know, the, you know lipid-lowering agents or... Or, um, or neurological drugs, or diabetes drugs, et cetera. So, it, so the, frankly, it's not, these are not big money makers, which is why you don't see much advertisement for, for, for vaccines. Yeah, they're we advertising Cialis on our shows. They're not advertising for a um, childhood vaccine. Secondly, it, it, you don't have to trust pharmaceutical companies. I mean, if, if safety is the issue, um, the, the, there is something called the Vaccine Safety Data Link, which is a linked computerized medical record, you know, nine HMO uh, of, um, the phenomenon that's been around since the late 1980s where the minute a vaccine is, is, is brought onto the, to the market or is used, you very quickly know who's getting it and who's not. And so if there is a problem, it will very quickly be picked up. I mean, frankly, if, if Vioxx were a vaccine, it would have been picked up as a rare cause of heart attacks much quicker. So you don't, you don't have to trust pharmaceutical companies. I mean, ethics aside, it's not good business to make, vac to make products that hurt otherwise healthy children. So... I don't, and there is no conspiracy is the, the bottom line. But, you know, so there are some people when I get these calls, I can tell within 30 seconds whether or not I'm going to make any headway on this. I mean, some people believe, you know, I'm just part of this, you know, we doctors are just part of this big conspiracy and you're, you're not going to win. But 
All you have on your side is reason. You just have to provide it in a compelling way. Did you make money on disease, not on prevention? <laughs> That's true. Right. That's where the real money is. <laughs> so eat right and exercise and get some sleep, and <laughs> they won't make money on you. Yep. Yeah, I have a question about the recent act by Google to begin ranking websites based on how reliable they seem to be. So I'm wondering if there's going to be an effort from people working in media on using that as a tool in, in their own reporting. Hmm. Well, uh, speaking for the people I work with, we tend not to get our information from Google. Um, we tend to actually call the people involved and get it from them. I mean, when we read the studies, we call the doctor who did the study, and we read the study, and you know, we don't see if someone's website has said it's a good study. So, but if but you can get on the first Google page, your cake, because no one goes to page two of a Google search. So that's going to be good for science-based medicine in general, because the good stuff is going to rise to the top, and hopefully Dr. Mercola and the uh, natural news will disappear onto page 10 and never be seen again. Yeah. And Facebook's experimenting. They, they promise they're going to experiment with something similar where you can basically kind of downvote things that are clearly fraudulent. Um, It'd be interesting to see how that works. I mean, a lot of their traffic comes from Woo, so uh, it's not yeah. necessarily in their best interest, but, but they're talking about it too, So that, which is it's just a force for good if that actually happens. The Why doesn't anyone talk about the forces of big Woo? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, natural news is a highly profitable concern. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure that uh, natural news have come up with their own search engine called Wackaloon or something. <laughs> Put their stuff up to the top. <laughs> yep. Yeah, uh, I have a question about... Um, going back to where you talk about studies being reported in the media. Um, mm -hmm. When I've read in the common media about a study finding, you know, X decreases the risk of cancer or something, mm -hmm. it will often simply say a study. It will sometimes say something like a study from the University of Texas or something. Mm -hmm. It will basically never say a study by Brown, Smith, et al., published right. in the Journal of Infectious Disease, Volume 29, March 31st, 2005, That's or 2015. Because right now you're in the shower, yeah. <laughs> well, not, it doesn't even say that like online in a link. Is, the, is that the presumption that like just adding that is going to make people like listen less? And also if you would, so I don't have to like dig really hard on Google to actually find the study so I can read it, that would make me so um, happy. I'm sorry, you're, you're one of the three or four people in the world who would like that. Um, <laughs> since I am in broadcasting, um, I, I can't. It's boring um, to most people. Uh, what, in theory, what ABC News is bringing to the table is a little bit of curation. So that if we refer to a study, we almost always, by the way, say a study out of fill in the blank hospital or institution. Um, or we say a study in pediatrics this week or published today in The Lancet so that you have somewhere to go. But we would hope that you trust us that that's what we're doing is making sure. And believe me, there's lots of big studies that uh, appear in these magazines that we don't touch because there was a big one um, that finally children are losing weight. My God, after all of this childhood obesity, wow, look at this. Uh, now the new study says that kids are losing weight. And we thought, well, whoa. Give me the study, and we read the study. And yes, one slice of children in the two years measured, they were two to three-year-olds were losing weight. All the other kids were stable or gaining weight. And they were writing it up as Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign works. Two to three-year-olds aren't in school, so they are not getting the Let's Move campaign. And they were the only cohort that was losing weight. And we said, we can't do the piece. And believe me, all the people on all the shows wanted to do the piece. They were like, are you kidding them? We've got great footage of Michelle Obama. It's lots of fun. It's a, and it's like, yeah, but it's not a good study. Sorry. No, I share your it. frustration because if you try and deconstruct a Dr. Oz column, <laughs> trying to find the references is extremely painful. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I like footnotes. Um, mm -hmm. Everything should be footnoted. I agree.
Yeah, we try at Slate. We try to link to the original article whenever possible. And I used to work at, at Science Magazine. And of course, if you read, you know, Science Nature's news department or, or anything that's you know at a more sophisticated audience, they do include the full citation. But I agree, it's maddening when when they don't and you can't figure out what they're babbling about. Uh, we have about like two minutes left, so. So I made this very quick then. Yeah. I wonder what the panel thought about the changes in Australia that they know, were, were announced recently about um, child care allowances being removed if you didn't get your children vaccinated. I'm sorry, I'm not hearing you. So it, very recently in Australia, they were announcing that if parents don't get their children vaccinated, they would lose certain child care allowances. It would be sort of like a state-sponsored encouragement to get vaccinations done. Uh, I haven't read the full articles, but it's been on my Facebook feed all week. <laughs> <laughs> no one heard that? I, I don't know. I'm not familiar with it. There's, there's a whole lot of different things that different governments and are, are trying to do to encourage I think the question really was, do you think there's anything the government here could do to sort of encourage people to get their children vaccinated? Here? Yeah, yes. We have such nice universal health care in the United States. I think that will work well as an approach. <laughs> yeah. I can address part of it. I mean, I, I think, you know, so... so um, it's not hard to not vaccinate your child in this country. I mean, obviously all 50 states have medical exemptions as they should. Um, it depends on how you define it, but say roughly 47 states have religious exemptions. Uh, 19 states have philosophical exemptions. I, I would, you know, those, those uh, non-medical exemptions certainly aren't constitutionally mandated. I mean, those are simply state decisions and they're invariably political um, and represent, frankly, the activity of parents who don't want to get vaccines in those states. That's where the, the outbreaks occur. They occur in places where you can exempt yourself easily from vaccination. Now you're seeing a pushback to that finally. You're finally starting to see states try and push back against philosophical exemptions. I think, that it, I think it would be of value to children in this country to eliminate non-medical exemptions. First of all, they don't make sense. I mean, you know, personal belief exemptions, vaccines aren't a belief system, they're an evidence-based system. Philosophical exemption, phyla, love, sophos, wisdom, where's the wisdom that says it's better not to get a vaccine than get one? And religious exemptions, really? I mean, I would argue putting your child in unnecessarily in harm's way with something that could hurt them or kill them is not a religious act. But, you know, we, this is what we do. This is the euphemism we have. I mean, I think we should call them what they are, which is that I don't see these diseases anymore. I'm not scared of them. I think Jenny May McCarthy may be onto something, and I don't want to get vaccines exemption. That, that would be more honest. Uh, but we don't call them that because it's too long, I guess. But... <laughs> Um, it's, it's, uh, you know, but it's hard to take freedoms once given away. And so you, that's why you're seeing enormous pushback. We'll see how it plays out. I mean, I'd like to think that the momentum that's occurred with this Disney outbreak will carry forward for a while, but I, I'm afraid um, that Anne's right, that it's probably going to take more than that, and it may take a death or two to get people's attention again. I hope it doesn't come to that. I think in Oregon or Washington, I can't remember which one, they uh, modified the law so that now you can have a philosophical objection, but you also have to have, as you're objecting, a piece of paper in your hand signed by your pediatrician that says, that's okay with me. And when they put that in, the uh, number of philosophical objections went way down. Because if you make it any more difficult to do it, then a lot of people say, oh, well, fine, whatever. Let's get the vaccination. So we done? We, we done. <laughs>